Hello! Hi, good evening! Uh, it's Esther Nagel here from Balance and Breathe and celebrating today one year of being able to say I'm an author. Uh, it's a year today since Bent Back Into Shape, Beating Addiction Through Yoga was published and some of you have been downloading it on the Kindle where it is free today. Um, it's going to be free until Wednesday so if any more of you want to download it You've got plenty of time. Please do. Please enjoy it. And um, I hope that you get something valuable from it. Lots of people have told me that they found it valuable, even if um, even people who don't have any um, alcohol or drug addiction, there's something in there that you can all take from the book. After all, yoga wasn't created as a way to beat addiction. So um, as I go quite deeply into the yoga throughout the book, there is something there that can help you, that can give something to your life. And um, yeah, apparently, apparently it's, it's quite a helpful book for many people. So um, I'm going to read a chapter tonight about the Yamas and the Niyamas. Now this is quite a long chapter. Um, there's lots, well there are ten together, ten yamas and niyamas, five yamas, five niyamas, and I've talked quite a bit about each of them, so um, I'll be reading for quite a long time. I've already read loads of Harry Potter tonight, actually it's, it's a very long chapter, um, so I'll get cracking. <laughs> so yamas and niyamas, the foundation of Patanjali's eight limbs of yoga are the yamas and niyamas. They are often referred to as the moral and ethical restraints. They are the bedrock of a good, solid yoga practice. We cannot really be cl claimed to be practicing yoga if we do the physical work, the asana and the pranayama, but ignore the yamas and niyamas. Dr. Ananda Balayogi Bhavanani, Swami Gitananda's son, says in, the in Understanding the Yoga Darshan that the greatest joy and growth comes in the effort. It is very hard in the modern Western world to attain perfection in these yamas and niyamas, but it is not impossible, and the lack of perfection doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. We gain lots when we try to live according to the yamas and niyamas. Every effort towards them brings great rewards. The yamas and niyamas do not exist in isolation. They are very independent, interdependent, but they feed each other. For example, at the start of my training, I was a vegetarian and considered that I was acting in a way that was ethical and humane. I did not believe that animals were suffering so that I could eat the cheese omelettes that I loved so much. Through contemplation of ahimsa, non-harming, armed with a little knowledge about the treatment of animals in the dairy industry, I came to see through Swadhyaya that in order to be true to my values, satya, to ensure I was eating clean food, saucha, and not causing harm, ahimsa, or not taking what was mine, asteya, I needed to change to a plant-based diet. Sticking to this diet requires control of cravings, which is brahmacarya, and discipline, tapas, but it's worth it as I now feel that my diet reflects my values. This approach can be applied to all aspects of life. Contemplation of the yamas and the niyamas helps me to be a better mother, a better homemaker, a better teacher. They are all about helping us become better on every level of our being. And if we do nothing but try to live according to these values, we are living yoga at a very high level indeed. While the yamas and niyamas can influence how we act and think, they also apply to what we allow others to do to us. For example, if I leave something of value in an unlocked car and it gets stolen. I must take responsibility for this and accept that I allowed it to happen. The yamas and niyamas protect us from falling into victim mode and encourage us to remember that we are 100% responsible for our lives. The yamas. The yamas help us to move beyond our base animal nature, help us to function better in society and overcome urges based on our survival instincts. As conscious human beings, we are capable of going further than mere survival. The survival instinct is strong in us all, but it doesn't need to be the force that drives our behaviour. Ahimsa. 
Ahimsa means non-violence. This is commonly translated as non-harming. This means that you should endeavour to make sure that your actions, words and thoughts do not harm another. At its most obvious level, this means not committing acts of violence on another. And this is why so many yoga practitioners are vegetarian or vegan. Beyond this, ahimsa means not hurting another with your words, trying to control your thoughts, not sitting in judgment of others, not spreading hurtful gossip and avoiding harm, for example, in the media. It also means to not harming other creatures that live on this planet and taking care of the environment we live in. Ahimsa affected my thoughts on drinking because it asked us to look at the harm we are doing ourselves. By drinking and smoking, I knew I was harming myself, but thinking about Ahimsa made me, really, made me contemplate it at a deeper level. I made efforts to stop being so cruelly judgmental to myself as well as to others. I reflected on the harm that my drinking habits were doing to others, especially my children. On its own, wasn't enough to this wasn't enough to change my behaviour. After all, I had known that my behaviour was harmful for years, but this self-study was part of a bigger and more profound process. Satya. Satya means truthfulness. At its most basic level, it means that you shouldn't tell lies. In his Lost Teachings of Yoga, Georg Furstein tells us that there are six types of lie. The blatant lie, the white lie, lying by silence, advertising, statistics and politics. While this made me laugh the first time I heard it, there is so much truth in it. I would add a seventh lie of media, as I think we all know our media sources are highly biased and not above blatantly making up stories to affect the mindset of their readers. Beyond not lying to others, Satya tells us that we should not lie to ourselves. This is really hard to change, as most of us probably don't realise just how much we do it. We procrastinate on work that needs to be done, telling ourselves that we'll do it tomorrow. We think we are either better or worse at something than we actually are, and we often have an inflated or reduced sense of our own value. Our ideas of truth are always based on our perceptions of events as opposed to reality. Similarly, our memories of events are far from factual records, as they are affected by both our perceptions at the time and how we perceive the event from the time we are remembering it. Satya also teaches us to be true to who we are, to learn to see past the walls, the barriers and the filters that we put up around ourselves to shield us from ourselves and the world, to see the real self inside. For years, I had an idea of myself I called Fantasy Esther. She was everything I wanted to be, but didn't think I ever could be. Once I really started to understand yoga, I realised I was starting to become her. Fantasy Esther wasn't a fantasy at all, but the real true me. I'm still not there yet, but I'm getting closer to her all the time. When we are living in accordance with Satya, our values, our inner barometer of who we are and how we should be, it shows in our behaviour and we can start to feel more at ease with ourselves. While I was drinking, although I, I dreamed about fantasy Esther, I fought any desire to actually become her. I completely identified with this idea of myself as a frantic drunk, even though I would never admit to myself the truth that I was an alcoholic. I wouldn't allow the true me to surface at all. The minute I started to hear that voice, the one that reminded me I wanted happiness, not wine, I would reach for another glass or another cigarette and push it away. Eventually, through the yoga practices I was learning, I was able to break down the barriers I had built and started to want to get to know the real me more. I realised I needed to be okay with the pain and the unhappiness I had been hiding from, to face it so that I could start to heal it. Once I began to do this, it became easy for me to release myself from the grip of alcoholism. Asteya. Asteya is non-stealing. It is obvious, of course, that this means that we shouldn't steal from others, and most of us wouldn't think twice about doing so, or would we? Do you download from torrent sites on the internet? Many people do this and don't consider it stealing, but it's not any different to walking into a shop and putting a CD in your pocket. I used to do this all the time and thought nothing of it, but eventually the lessons of a stay are filtered through to me and I no longer down any, download any album or film without paying for it. There are many ways we can steal from others without taking their property. We can steal someone's time, demanding their attention when it is really needed elsewhere. We may take credit for someone else's work, 
borrow things and never return them, or steal someone's ideas and claim them for their own. Through contemplation of Asteia, I came to realise I was very guilty of this in many ways. I was particularly struck by how much I was taking from my children. I would often steal their time, especially when I spent many weekends and holidays hungover. I would sometimes rush through bedtime stories or omit them completely so that I could get to my wine downstairs. If I was drinking with friends, I would often put listening to them above listening to my children. What was even more damaging, though, was how I was denying them a healthy life, a healthy view of themselves and of the world by putting my negativity and addiction in the way of my parenting. I was making it very likely that Marcus would have to deal with losing his mother through an alcohol-related illness at a young age. I was 37 when he was born, so was already an old mum. I needed to do everything I can to ensure I live as long as possible for his sake. I was doing the exact opposite of this, and also increasing the likelihood that my parents would have to say goodbye to another child, something I knew would cause my mother in particular no end of pain and grief. I never wanted to do that to her, but I was unable to put, stop my drinking, despite knowing that I was putting my life at risk every time I did it. I also started to see how much I was taking from myself through my addiction. I was denying myself the opportunity to grow and learn from life's experiences. By drinking to escape my emotions rather than exploring them, I was missing out. I was also stopping myself from doing other, more life-affirming and beneficial activities. Swami Kitananda tells us that procrastination is theft. This is one of my biggest weaknesses nowadays. I've been exploring this a lot recently and have come to the conclusion that I am addicted to procrastination. Stephen Pressfield in The War of Art tells us that procrastination is a device of resistance and that what we resist most is what we most need for our soul's growth. How ironic is this? The thing we most need to do in order to grow are the things we need, the, the things we find ourselves most resistant to. Swami Gitananda calls this wasting the time of the spirit and tells us this is theft. This he would consider the worst theft of all, as the purpose of life is to evolve and grow on a spiritual level. I certainly know I'm far more content in life if I do the things I need to do, such as write this book than if I flitter my day away avoiding the task. <laughs> I'm glad I read that paragraph. I've been procrastinating quite a lot lately. Good to remember. <laughs> Brahmacharya. This yama is often translated as celibacy. While it needn't mean absolute celibacy, it does mean behaving with restraint and not succumbing to every physical de desire of the body. It can be applied to many areas of life. In the devout yogi, it would mean complete abstinence from any form of sexual activity or sexual thought, but it is possible to bring this yama into life without this extreme interpretation. Georg Furstein advises us that complete abstinence is not for everyone, and that one shouldn't feel bad if it's not possible. It's better to, obtain for, it, it's better to aim for moderation of behaviour and succeed at that than aim for abstinence and spend our whole life anxious of failure. Well, I would, never try to, I, I would never try to commit to this fully. While sex is not a big issue to me now, I don't want to rule it out completely for the rest of my life. Devout yogis would reserve sexual activity only for the purposes of procreation and ma in marriage. I am unmarried and certainly don't want any more children. However, younger, more insecure Esther would have benefited from thinking about Brahmacharya a little as it might have helped her to see that casual sex was no substitute for love and self-esteem. Just because men wanted to sleep with her didn't mean that she had to let them. Things to tell your younger self. <laughs> That's top of the list. I did write that letter once and that was top of the list. Swami Gitananda in his step-by-step -step course tells us that there are other interpretations of this yama. Brahmacharya refers not to not allowing things that overstimulate the senses and emotions into our life. In our modern world, this could refer to violent films, loud music, and a desire for possessions and overindulgent foods. It means not allowing desires and addictions to control our lives and behavior. It means learning to control the impulses and constant desire for sensory pleasure and to master self-control. It teaches delayed or denied gratification, a skill we are in danger of losing completely in our have-it-now society. 
It helps us to remember that just because we think we want something, it doesn't mean we have to have it. We often find that when we succumb to such urges, the object of desire ends up being disappointing. Anyone who has experienced buyer's remorse will testify to this. I just want to pop out of the book for a second because I, um, I read an article earlier on which I'm going to share onto the page later. It's very relevant to this. Uh, it's a George Monbiot article and he's talking about how much... Um, I only scanned read it. I need to read it better. But he was talking about apparently 1% of the things that we give at Christmas... 1%? I'm sure that was the number I said. But in general, 1% of the things that we give at Christmas are still being used six months later. And an awful lot of the stuff that we give people at Christmas is not even meant to last longer than that. All those novelty gifts he talks about, you know, all the, the silly things that you buy for people and you don't know what to buy for them. Um, and I think, you know, what he's basically suggesting is maybe don't buy anything. Spend a day with them instead. Um... I'm going off on a tangent there. I could say a lot about that article. There might be a blog post coming about that one at some point. Uh, back to the book. I imagine that modern yoga scholars will also cite the use of the internet as something that needs to be controlled through Brahma Karya. In the age of smartphones and social media, internet addiction is becoming increasingly problematic, making us incredibly overstimulated and constantly seeking stimulus. Brahmacharya may be the hardest yama for modern Western yoga practitioners to master, as our society is engineered to make us want possessions and constant sensory stimulation. It takes a great deal of effort to break the patterning that tells us that material possessions bring happiness, that sex is vital for self-esteem and happiness, and that alcohol is the best way to relax and socialise. I certainly have succumbed to this idea many times and have sought happiness, self-worth and fulfilment in sensory experiences. I'm sure I will again. The pleasure to be found in dark chocolate can be incredibly seductive. But I try to limit the times I succumb and, of my, and I'm mindful of moments when succumbing to my desires would actually result in me feeling worse about myself than I did beforehand. A parigraha. This is closely related to Brahmacharya in that it tells us not to take more than we are entitled to, not to hold possessions, not to be selfish or greedy and not to exploit others. It can also be applied to people in our lives. We shouldn't make unreasonable demands on people or try to possess them. We shouldn't seek happiness in material possessions or others. We can only find true happiness through our own spiritual development. Addiction makes us selfish and greedy. We don't choose to be, but it's the nature of the beast. We place more importance on acquiring the object of our addiction than we do on other things. Life revolves around the addiction. For some, this means spending the day doing anything to enable them to get the next fix. For others, it means getting through the normal day so that you can shut the door on the world and cocoon yourself in the addiction. I would prioritise my need for alcohol and cigarettes above pretty much anything else. I would feed the children. They never went hungry. And I had a rule that unless we were socialising with friends, I didn't start drinking until they were in bed. I would construct reasons to have company, either inviting people around or visiting. I didn't want any friends reading. I don't want any friends reading this to think that my friendship was false. I did enjoy their company, but often the main driver was having an excuse to drink or not wanting to drink alone. I allowed friends to buy my drinks and cigarettes as my desired consumption often far exceeded my available funds and was not averse to taking sneaky mouthfuls of their drinks when they went to the loo. So while I was never out actively going out and actively stealing to get my fix, I was taking what wasn't freely given and exploiting the good nature of my friends. Thinking about trying to live more in line with the Parigraha meant that I felt a greater need to contribute and pay my way. This need to ensure that we contribute seems to be a very common theme in addiction recovery. The addiction sector seems to be run largely by volunteers and staff who themselves are in recovery. It seems that after a lifetime of taking and grasping in order to feed the addiction monster, former addicts see the massive value in giving back to their communities. In my experience, it feels good to contribute to the services that supported my recovery and to help others in the same situation. 
I feel a lot better about my past knowing that I can take what I've learned from my addiction and misery and put it to good use through writing this book and sharing my knowledge through classes and workshops. I have attended a couple of conferences and events which showcase the huge amount of contribution ex and current service users make to the addiction and recovery sector. Many organisations wouldn't function without them. It's truly heartening to see. In my view, it also utterly negates the judgmental view society makes that addicts are bad people. If they were bad people, they would be such with or without their addiction. This act of helping others may help to develop the empathy that the addicted brain shuts down. Research suggests that rather than fostering feelings of pleasure in individuals, acts of altruism actually develop the posterior, t posterior superior temporal cortex, the part of the brain that is concerned with the feelings of others. Altruism is associated with... Oh, and that's from an article called Altruism is associated with an increased neural response to agency. On to the Niyamas now. If the Yamas tell us what we shouldn't be doing with our bodies and minds, the, niy the Niyamas tell us what we should be doing to enhance ourselves and become the very, very, the very best versions of ourselves. The Niyamas help us with our spiritual growth and help us reach our potential both in the material world and in our spiritual life. Saucha. This Niyama refers to the purity and cleanliness of the body, mind and emotions. It tells us that we should take care of personal hygiene and wear clean clothes, but it goes far deeper than that. It refers to internal cleanliness, that, so, that, so we should take care of what we put into our bodies. is clean, nutritious and not harmful. Saucha reminds us that our thoughts, words and actions need to be wholesome. This would include stopping negative emotions from taking control of us. It encourages us to free ourselves of preconceived notions and prejudices and to have an open mind to the ideas and opinions of others, even those we disagree with. A fresh approach to an issue can lead to new solutions to problems. Sauter often refer, also refers to our external environment and it encourages us to keep our living space clean. We need to pay heed to the needs of the wider environment and live a sustainable life that doesn't harm the natural world around us. Saucha encourages us to live a simple life with little clutter both in our environment and in ourselves. Anyone who has ever had a clear out in their home will recognise that the process seems to clear the mind as well. This is because you're freeing up mental as well as physical space. Although thinking about Saucha didn't tell me anything I didn't already know about what I was doing to my body and mind by drinking and smoking, my desire to live according to the values of Saucha meant that I at last was forced to contemplate this on a different level. It stopped being about avoiding harm and became about being healthy, which is a very different perspective. In NLP terms, this is about having a towards rather than an away from mindset. Focusing on the positives I could gain was far more motivating than the fear of what I was risking. Drinking was clearly harming my body, but it was also doing the same to my mind. The thought patterns that led me to the off license and the thoughts I would have when I was drunk were dra damaging to myself. I developed quite a nasty sense of humour and was a horrible and careless neighbour, playing loud music at night with no regard for others. I would prioritise drinking over personal or domestic hygiene and the rubbish I would generate was harming the environment, despite my outward claims to care about environmental issues. Physically, a drinking session would involve chain smoking while remaining stationary. No, nothing in my life was clean. Santosha. Santosha is the mental calm that comes as the result of a calm and peaceful mind. This sense of calm allows us to forge deeper, more meaningful relationships with others. When our mind is constantly busy, it doesn't have space for this level of spiritual or personal intimacy. Santosha allows us to find constant peace and contentment within ourselves, instead of needing to find it in things that are external to ourselves. Conditions cannot destroy our contentment when we are living in Santosha. Yoga tells us that one of the root causes of unhappiness is desire. If we can be content in our current lives, we can eliminate this desire and find inner peace. Santosha and Gratitude 
How we view the world very much shapes our experience of it. If we are always expecting negative things to happen, if we always focus on what we don't have rather than what we do have, then we are going to experience unhappiness. Santosha teaches us to be satisfied and content with what we have, to be grateful for what is good in our lives and to look for the positives. This is such a powerful practice and something that certainly helps me in my sobriety. Santosha reminds us that while we may have troubles in life and we may not have all that we want or even need, we do still have blessings. If we focus on those, then we will feel a level of contentment that is impossible if we are worrying constantly about what is missing from our life. Much has been written about the benefits of a gratitude practice. It has been reported to improve physical and mental health, increase mental resilience, empathy and self-esteem. It promotes better sleep and reduces aggression. All of these benefits are very important to the recovery process. They create resilience and personal recovery capital and are a crucial set of inner resources that are needed for sustainable recovery. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the likes. I just noticed those. Practicing gratitude supports recovery from mental illness as well as addiction and is in fact beneficial to everyone. If we ensure that we have these inner resources, we may well be able to avoid mental illness and addiction in the first place. Tapas. The literal translation of tapas is fire. It refers to the fire of discipline and personal control. Tapas tells us that we must be disciplined in our practice and in our day-to-day -day life. It requires focus, dedication and commitment to our goals. It means that we approach our yoga practice with the three R's of yoga, repetition, regularity and rhythm. A half-hearted, sporadic effect, attempt at a yoga practice is not going to yield much reward compared to a regular and dedicated routine. Similarly, tapas applies in our life away from the yoga mat. We should approach our work in the same manner. For example, I want to write this book. In order to do this, I must write regularly with dedication and focus. I will never write a book if I only write 20 words a day, writing when I feel like it. I am making myself write every day until the writing is finished. I will continue to write on a daily basis once this is done because I recognise that it is of great benefit to me in my Swadhyaya. In the interest of truthfulness, I didn't do that. I write a lot, but I didn't keep up writing every day. I do that quite a lot though. <laughs> Tapas helped me in my recovery because it created a mindset shift, mindset shift that was vital if I was ever to be free. I look back in horror now at the many occasions when I would leave a yoga class full of self-righteous feelings of being good because I had done yoga, then proceed to open a bottle of wine, roll a joint and end the night in familiar oblivion. I had no idea then that yoga was so much more than the exercise class I was attending and saw no contradiction in my behaviour. <laughs> the power of delusion and denial. <laughs> it was only when I saw that personal self-control and discipline were a crucial aspect of yoga that I began to free myself from my addiction and self-destruction. Patanjali tells us that the fire of discipline destroys all impurities, resulting in mastery of body and senses. My brother got married about six weeks after my alcoholic revelation, which... You haven't heard about because I haven't read that chapter. But it's in the book. I had decided that I wasn't going to drink at all that day, despite the proliferation of good quality red wine and champagne that was going to be available on request throughout the day. Although I had told my family that I wasn't going to be drinking, I don't think anyone would have objected much if I had. I did stick to my resolution and the realisation that I was able to enjoy myself, look after Marcus and not do anything to embarrass myself or my family was wonderful. I enjoyed waking up the following day with no feelings of shame or discomfort, feeling happy, awake and full of energy. It was that day that I realised I had definitely given up drinking and for the first time I felt sure that being an ex-drinker was my new identity. Swadiyaya Next section. Swadhyaya is introspectional self-analysis or self-study. The ultimate aim of it in yoga is to help us to connect with the divine aspect of us. 
before we can get to that stage of self-knowledge, we must first learn who we are in this life, why we have the life we have, and how we can make sure that we learn the lessons this life has to offer us. This is a very important and incredibly useful practice to incorporate into life. It is impossible to make meaningful change in life without first looking at where we are and trying to understand why. Bringing awareness to our life through our thoughts, words and actions is a crucial first step in breaking bad habits and creating new, healthier habits. I spent much of my adult life actively avoiding looking too closely at myself. When I did look, I always saw faults that I didn't want to admit to, features I didn't like and behaviours I was ashamed of. Instead of trying to change, I would try to hide my mistakes and find someone or something to blame. I would quickly become very defensive or alternatively would become dismissive of my failings. I rarely admitted I was wrong or apologised. Um, taking a little break from this now. I, I um, Maybe I hadn't read it at the time, but Brene Brown talks a lot about shame and um, those behaviours, the way that I behaved when I was full of shame about who I was, classic shame behavior <laughs> um denial anger trying to blame other people hiding is classic shame behavior so um if you want to know more about shame it's it's fascinating Brene brown's work is just absolutely incredible um i've listened to a lot i'm working on some of her stuff at the moment as an exercise in swadi yaya internet actually um so it, it's it's really good. She's really studied shame a lot. So it's a really, you know, research-based. She knows this stuff. So I highly recommend Brene Brown if you haven't looked into her at all. So back to the book. Yoga teacher training forced me to look very closely at myself. And I am so grateful for this. While I was utterly unable to stick to keeping the diary we were supposed to keep, my answers to the essay questions posed, as, posed to us elicited a great deal of self-study. By exploring the philosophy and the practices I was learning about and applying them to my life, I was able to discover truths, thoughts and patterns of behaviour in myself that I had never been aware of before. I enjoyed the free-flowing writing element as I allowed my subconscious mind to direct me. Many times I found myself staring in amazement at something I had just written, astonished by the revelation that had come to me without my conscious mind being aware. It was through this practice that I realised how beneficial writing is. I learned such a lot about myself and finally faced some painful truths. I did so for the first time with honestly, honesty and gratitude. Every painful realisation became an opportunity to grow, to lay demons to rest, to become more aware and to change the parts of me that didn't really fit anymore. Awareness is more than mere an intellectual awareness. I was aware before I smoked my first joint that drugs can be harmful. I knew very well the destructive nature of alcohol as one of my earliest memories is of being terrified by my nana in a drunken rage. And I certainly knew that smoking was bad. My brother and I had even terrorised our father into giving up when we were small. I didn't start doing any of these things because I didn't know they were bad for me. On some level, that was probably part of the appeal. They, they suited my self-destructive need for oblivion. The awareness I got from my Swadi Yaya helped me to quit because I reflected on the origins of this self-destructive drive in me, and still do. Whenever I notice a pattern of behaviour I don't like, I ask myself, where does this come from? I had one at the weekend. It was really good. Really helpful. An important part of Swadi Yaya that you, is that you must observe yourself without judgement. This does not come easy as we are steeped in fixed ideas of good and bad. When we learn to step away from this habit and see things as facts, we can look more objectively at events without passing value judgment or trying to second guess motives. While Swadi Yaya can help us to see that events and actions in the past have led us to where we are today, it's important that we don't blame the past and that we don't spend too much time focusing on it. In understanding the yoga darshan, Dr. Ananda says, Tomorrow will be the no, today will be the past tomorrow, and tomorrow will soon be today. So make use of the present moment, for it is only in the present that one may change the future. 
Swadhyaya helped me to see that I have complete responsibility for my life, my emotions and my happiness. Whatever has happened in the past has happened and I can choose to dwell on the negative aspect of those events or to find the lessons to be learned. Looking slightly more objectively at my past experiences has helped me develop compassion towards myself and to others. I can now see that my past actions have been the result of patterns of behaviour that developed in me as a result of my perception. This perception has nothing to do with other people and everything to do with me. Most of these perceptions began to be formed when I was a very small child. That small child could only make sense of the world from a very narrow perspective, but that perspective led me to make many conclusions about the world and my place in it. I carried these with me into adulthood. It's only through my swadhyaya that I have been able to see the conclusions I have formed as a child and the patterns of self-destructive behaviour that flowed from them. Armed with this knowledge, I have been able to break many of the pat these patterns to create a far happier, healthier present and future. I still practice Swadhyaya on a regular basis. This book is essentially an exercise in Swadhyaya. I am learning a great deal about myself while writing this, not least of all how I struggle to deal with resistance to writing. As Stephen Pressfield in The War of Art tells us that the things we feel the greatest resistance to are the things we need most for our spiritual growth. I can identify with this so much. My greatest resistances in life come from the things I actually most want to do in order to make my life better. Through this work, I am able to get closer and closer to the true me, the me that is timeless, fearless, joyful and at peace. It is impossible to get to this true self through denial and oblivion seeking. Swadhyaya helped me get sober and my continued sobriety helps me in my Swadhyaya. And the last section now, Ishwara Pranidhana. Ishwara Pranidhana, or as Swami Gitananda called it, Atman Pranidhana, is surrender to a higher power than ourselves. It is acceptance that we are bound to a bigger self than our individual egos, souls and bodies. People often say things like God moves in mysterious ways or things happen for a reason, which reveals some degree of this surrender. As Mita, the, the glacier of egoism, which I do explain another place in the book, makes this acceptance difficult, which is why we need to work to rise above the glaciers. We often don't like to accept that we cannot control everything and this leads to much unhappiness. Relinquishing control can feel like failure, but it is really the ultimate in liberation. That is not to say that we don't have our role to play, that we should just shrug our shoulders and do nothing. Ishwara Pranidhana reminds us that we cannot ever really create the end result. We can only take the required action with the best effort and accept the consequences as they come. As Swamiji used to say, do your best and leave the rest. The universe will take care of the results. Often the results that we want are not the results that we get. This can lead to stress and upset if we are overly attached to the results. But if we surrender, we can be happy that we get the results that are meant to be. I'm currently, currently experiencing a need to surrender during the process of writing this book. I am finding that I am not writing the book I had thought I was going to write. For a while I fought this, thinking that if I couldn't write the book I wanted to write, I may as well not write a book at all. But eventually I realised that I can, book, I can write the book that is being written now. I have no control over the outcome of my work. All I can control is the effort I put into writing the book. I can control the words I write and I can control my decision to publish it. Beyond that, it is not in my hands. I hadn't really thought about marketing it at this point. <laughs> I cannot control what anyone else thinks of it. I cannot control the impact, if any, that it will have in other people's lives. All I know for sure is that I must write it. My soul has been calling out for me to do so. And if I don't, I don't think I will ever feel happy. While I sincerely hope that it touches you on some level, to a very large extent, that is not part of my journey. Once you have it, it's out of my hands. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> oh, excuse me. When we plant a seed and nurture that seed until it bears fruit, 
We may congratulate ourselves on our good gardening skills, but the best gardener in the world cannot grow a seed to a fruit alone. The traditional practice of celebrating the harvest is a form of accepting the surrender of a higher consciousness. When we say grace before food or thank God, this is another example of surrender. This is the way, one of the main premises behind the Alcoholics Anonymous philosophy. We need to accept that a force greater than ourselves can help us. <coughs> oh dear. <laughs> this is off-putting to many as it conjures up images of a God which may not have significance in our lives. As I have already discussed in a previous chapter, I have scant regard for a God that I felt was both meaningless and destructive in my life. There was no way I was going to put my faith in that God for help. When I learned that yoga was a way to connect deeply to myself and that I could take responsibility for my own recovery, I realised recovery was a possibility. While I accepted, at last, full responsibility for my life and my journey, I knew that I was not embarking on the journey alone. There was a very definite acceptance of a higher power into my life, but it was a recognition that the higher power exists as my personal power and my connection to it. I may not have a name for this higher power, but I know it's there. That's all I need to know. Swami Gitananda calls Ishwara Pranidhana Atman Pranidhana. Atman is the Sanskrit word which refers to the self, the true essence of who we are. So Swamiji is telling us that Atman Pranidhana is not listening to God, but having the courage to listen to our own inner wisdom. This can be incredibly hard. Often our inner wisdom is telling us things the ego doesn't really want to listen to. Think of the angel and the devil on the shoulders of cartoon characters, the inner wisdom and the ego in conflict. Which does the character usually listen to? If we stop, listen and act on our inner wisdom, we will rarely go wrong. For many of us, it can be hard to even hear our inner wisdom. Yoga helps us to develop our ability to listen to and trust ourselves. In the activity pack I've created to accompany this book, there is a video in which I talk through a technique to still the mind and find peace. This is what many people call meditation. Through regular practice of this technique, you will find that you can hear and trust your inner wisdom. And I'm going to put a link in the comments of this video to the form so you can sign up and um, get that. It's moved. The pack is actually moved. I need to make a few updates. The pack is actually moved, so I will put that link in the comments below. And that's the end of that chapter. And um, I've just read to the internet for about three quarters of an hour. <laughs> um, come from reading Harry Potter to reading this. So that's the end of that chapter. Now, I wanted to, as well, read the chapter about pranayama. Uh, pranayama is the breath control, um, yogic breathing. Was that Ruth? Hey, Ruth. Uh, Ruth? Ruth? Did you pronounce it Ruth? My middle name is Ruth, and it's Ruth around where I live. <laughs> um, so yeah, I wanted to read the chapter about pranayama to you, but I'm not going to do it tonight because um, well, it's, it's bedtime, basically. Um, so I'm going to come back again tomorrow and I'm going to do a bit of a session as well as reading the chapter. What I thought I would do was take you through some breathing practices and um, actually turn it into a, a bit more of an interactive teaching thing as well. So we can have some uh, breathing practices together. And um, if I do it around about eight o'clock, then we can end with a nice relaxation as well. And, and then I can go to bed. Uh, so I will be here tomorrow at eight o'clock to read the chapter of um, about pranayama. It's only a very short chapter, but there's absolutely heaps more that I want to share with you about pranayama. Um, and today, it's nearly the anniversary of my tattoo. Uh, I got that when I was in India as well. And that says breathe. You can't really see it there because it's back to front. But it says breathe. That is my, um, that's my reminder of what I need to do. And that's it, really. So yeah, we'll have a, we'll have a, a nice, breathing pranayama session tomorrow at eight o'clock and um 
hope to see you there. I'm going to go to bed now. So thank you, Ruth. It's been lovely to see you. And I will see you tomorrow. Bye.